Calling to order the August 18th, 2020 County Board meeting. Are we certified in compliance with the open meeting law? Yes, the agenda was posted on the 14th of August at 3.30 p.m. Next item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item of business is roll call. Three supervisors present. Next item of business is the approval of the July 21, 2020 journal. Is there Supervisor Wagner? Move for approval, please. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Is there a second? Supervisor Immel? I'll make that second, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Immel. Under discussion? Okay, seeing no lights. Please vote. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Next is consideration of appointments by chairperson. To advise, uh, airport advisory committee, Thomas Wagner of Plymouth and Roger Testrudy of Oostburg. Supervisor Gehring. I move to concur with the appointment. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Sir, Supervisor Hoffman. Motion. Thank you, Supervisor Hoffman. Under discussion? Supervisor Nelson, did you have something? No, I have uh, question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, then if no discussion, please vote. Supervisor Hoffman, Supervisor Wagner. It's not showing, it's on this other screen. Supervisor Wagner and Supervisor Kulo. Hit your button again. Keep trying, Tom. It's not. Yeah, please. There you go. All right. All right. Those appointments are approved unanimously. Okay, next are consideration of appointments by county administrator. To Airport Advisory Committee, reappointments, Thomas Trester of Sheboygan, Stephen Bauer of Plymouth, Edward Ward III of Kohler. Supervisor Testrodi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move to approve the appointments. Thank you, Supervisor Testrodi. Supervisor Immel. I will make a second, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Immel. Under discussion? Okay, seeing no lights, please vote. We need uh, Supervisors Immel and Bosman to try your button again. Supervisor Bosman, a third time is a charm, awesome. 
Those appointments are approved unanimously. Are there any presentations? No presentations. Okay, public addresses? Public addresses. Uh, is Suzanne Speltz here? Yeah. Suzanne, come on up front. Up to the podium, state your name and address, and you'll have five minutes. I'll give you one minute remaining, okay? My name is Suzanne Speltz, and I'm at 3811 Hazard Valley Road in Sheboygan. And I come before you tonight to express my concern and outrage over ordinance number three, section 10.9. This clearly violates our constitutional rights, is government overreach, and is dangerous for us as citizens. The indicated ordinance gives an excessive amount of power to one or a few individuals. This clearly is an example of how Nazi Germany began and is a slippery slope, all under the guise of health and safety. We need to maintain our rights to decide what is best for our own health and for our family's health. As you know, there's a 47-page document entitled Guidance in Implementing Regulations Surrounding Communicable Diseases that is associated with this ordinance. There are frightening sections in this. For instance, it discusses that these health officers can come into our homes and forcibly remove us and place us in some other institution force us to participate in education and counseling, force us to undergo medical examinations and treatments, and prevent us from going to work. I have many questions here. Where are these facilities and what are the living conditions? What does education and counseling entail? What kinds of medical examinations and treatments are they forcing upon us? And how long will be people be detained against their will? And are these people able to contact their family and friends? Just the mere fact that the ordinance gives the government authority to force us to do all these things or face fines and jail time is scary to me. What I and other pictures that are in our minds are the horrors of Nazi concentration camps. Another concerning portion of this document is that DHS and its agents have expanded power to isolate and quarantine in the event that the governor declares a state of emergency and that any person that violates these can be subject to a $10,000 fine and up to nine months imprisonment. It goes on and states that a local health officer may employ as many persons necessary to execute his or her orders. These persons shall be sworn in as quarantine guards, shall have police powers, and may use all means necessary to enforce these laws and orders. To me, this is martial law. I used to trust my government officials for the most part, but not anymore, especially in light of this so-called pandemic. I've done a fair amount of research in this and this so-called pandemic, and I do not believe the narrative. I refer to it as a pandemic and a hoax. There's a lot of solid information out there which leads me to believe this. I also do not trust the reporting of the COVID testing, such as with the number of cases and their number of deaths. There's a great deal of information stating that these numbers are being falsified to advance the agenda. In addition, I believe that people and institutions are being paid large amounts of money for helping contribute to this lie. Another question is how long have you all known about this ordinance and the implementation of it? There was a training that occurred yesterday already. If this ordinance was only being put in for possible future use in the event of a surge, why did Health and Human Services feel the need to call a special session last Friday to introduce it? It would seem that people know that there will be a surge. And how does anybody know this, I ask? I call it problem solution. They come up with the problem, they come up with the solution. I believe this has been hidden purposely from the public until the last minute in hopes that no one would say anything. As elected and employed county officials, I request that you each take a good look at what these documents are saying. Can you see what this is leading to? You have one would, minute. would you wish for your family, friends, and loved ones to be subjected to this? Our forefathers and citizens of our country have fought hard for the freedoms we have here. 
And now some people want to take that away. Here is one piece of truth we can stand on. We must all be th- appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done on this earth. A vote, a yes vote, places this on your conscience. I ask you all to vote no to this ordinance. Thank you, Suzanne. Next is Jonathan Hexeth. I'm sorry, Hesketh. Sorry. Good evening. Thank you for including me on tonight's agenda to speak. My name is Jonathan Hesketh. I'm a resident at 224 2nd Street, Sheboygan Falls. I am concerned about the proposed ordinance number three that is being introduced to the board tonight. My concern is that this ordinance seem, seemingly gives unlimited authority to impose and enforce penalties for non-compliance to public health orders as determined by the county health officer. The county health officer is an unelected individual and therefore is not accountable to the citizens of Sheboygan County. The language in this ordinance is broad and vague and nowhere does it specify that it is only for COVID-19. The language in the ordinance states, quote, COVID-19 and other communicable diseases, end quote. This language indicates this could include all communicable diseases, for example, the common cold or influenza, and so on. This kind of vague and open-ended governance is unacceptable. It leaves the citizens of Sheboygan County vulnerable to this abuse of power. This ordinance ignores due process and government accountability. This ordinance will force business owners to question patrons if they have medical exemptions to health orders. It would encourage prejudice and suspicion among fellow fellow citizens. My concern is justified in this, that this ordinance is being introduced now when the supposed curve has been flattened and there is no health crisis in Sheboygan County. None of the county's hospitals are overrun with COVID-19 cases. It has been suggested that this ordinance is necessary in the event there would be a sudden surge in infections. As of Monday, August 17th, the number of active cases in Sheboygan County was 105, which is approximately 0.09% of the county's population. Seven of these cases are hospitalized, which is 6.6% of the active cases. Currently, the rate of hospitalized infection in Sheboygan County is 0.006%. As of Monday, August 17th, there have been 887 confirmed cases in Sheboygan County since March 13th. That is approximately three quarters of 1% of the population that has been confirmed infected. As of 2 p.m. on Monday, August 17th, the hospital capacity in Sheboygan County is 24 available ICU and surgical beds with nine currently occupied with COVID-19 related patients. It is unreasonable to think that we would have an overwhelming surge of infections in Sheboygan County when the amount of hospitalizations has been in consistent decline in Wisconsin. There, where is the evidence that there will be a sudden surge of cases and that those cases will require ICU treatment? Trends from the health department's own data shows no such evidence. If this, broad, if this board is convinced there is a need for an ordinance to control the spread of COVID-19, Why is the language of the ordinance not specific that it is for only COVID-19? Why draft it with such a broad and open-ended language? The low amount of cases in Sheboygan County is no justification for a permanent forfeiture of individual liberties. And this ordinance violates the sacred freedom of the individual controlling one's health and well-being. Members of the board, I ask all of you to protect the individual liberties of the citizens of Sheboygan County by voting no on County Ordinance Number 3. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Stephanie Arndt. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, My name is Stephanie Arndt. I live at 535 Richmond Avenue in Sheboygan Falls. Uh, I was in attendance at the last county board meeting in July for the the first time. Um, As the meeting began, I grew kind of disgusted. We, the group that came, we were blasted by all the virtue signaling about mask wearing, how those in the room 
that cared were wearing masks, that those who were taking responsibility were wearing masks, and just doing as they're told. Um, and so who, who is telling us to do this? Experts, um, public health officials, the government, so, so the same experts that came out with models that were so far off, but we're supposed to keep trusting them. The same experts that say that we're supposed to do things that are not healthy for our immune systems, um, like staying indoors, wearing a cloth over your face that catches the bacteria that your body is actually expelling, and then breathing that back in by staying far away from people as far as possible, disconnecting from those around us, it's, it's like watching robots in a store. It's, it's, very, it's quite sad to see. Um, did you know that the number one cause of death in the country, or the number three, I'm sorry, is medical error, mistakes by experts? Um, and I'm just going to share this story with you that I've only shared with like five people in my life, and now it's going on Fox News. <laughs> um, about 13 years ago, I actually worked for the Department of Health doing vision and hearing screenings, and I was guilted very strongly into getting a Tdap vaccine in order to protect the kids that I would be working with so, I, um, so that I wouldn't unknowingly spread something to them that, that I may or may not know that I have. Does that sound familiar? Uh, I was not informed of any risks associated with the vaccine, and following this vaccine, I had a miscarriage. Uh, this vaccine is not tested on pregnant women. None of them actually are, um, but it is pushed on them. And why did I take this? Because a health department nurse, a medical professional, told me that I needed to. Now, I take responsibility for my decision. I hadn't done the research that I have done now. But we are being told through this whole ordeal to just listen to the experts, people who have been wrong over and over again. Now, I know this ordinance doesn't contain the word vaccine, um, but it does say other things, uh, many which actually Suzanne had outlined already. Uh, but 251.06 uses the words reasonable and necessary. Who defines these terms? 252.03 says, upon the appearance of any communicable disease, the officer shall take all measures necessary. 252.6 um, says that the officer can employ guards um, put in place for quarantine. The, guards, the quarantine guard shall be sworn in and have police powers. Uh, the officer, if it deems necessary, shall remove a person. Do you know that person means child? I was just in contact with someone who's being threatened with having their child removed because she was sick. 252.25 says you can be in prison for more than 30 days or fined for not more than $500. Uh, the DHS 145 says that you w would have to participate in a treatment. So what have we heard over and over and over again is the treatment or the only way that we're going to get back to normal for this. Uh, it starts with a V, if you didn't know. Um, and let's see, uh, an officer can direct you to go undergo exams and tests, desist from employment, uh, be placed in an in institutional treatment facility. All of these are very concerning. You have one minute. Um, so the thing that, that is troubling to me and I have questions about is the oversight. You have the, the HHS committee, which is six people that are on this board. Then it comes to this board, which is 25 of you board members. Then it's going to go to an executive committee, which is five of the same board members. And then it comes back to here to be voted on. I, I, I'm, I have a lot of questions on the oversight of this and how this is going to be put into place. Um, I, I do not give consent to any governing body or health department to have any control over my health and that of my family. Because of the guidelines of the HHS and the DPI, my children will not be enrolled in schools. And I'm not going to force them to be taking place in any of this new normal, because it's not normal. Medicine is not one size fits all. A mandate cannot be one size fits all. A mandate shouldn't even be put in place unless there is solid evidence backing it. Um, let's see. And um, I am kind of upset with the, the rules that were put into place last time that have limited this room to only 10 people of the public. I, we asked for transparency. Um, 
And this is a public meeting, so we'd all, as the public, would like to be able to attend this. And I think that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Rainery. My name is John Ranieri, 2017 North 6th Street in Sheboygan. I want to thank the board for this opportunity to speak today regarding the proposed ordinance number three. I, as well as others of the members of the community, have several concerns about the proposal as it is written, as well as some broader issues inherent to individual freedoms and societal responsibilities. In section one, I have several concerns and questions. In subsection A, it basically states that upon the appearance of any communicable disease, the health officer will investigate all circumstances and make a full report to the board and the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Do you mean any communicable diseases, such as a cold, flu, or rash, just as some possible examples? Are there going to be spot checks or will citizens call to have a business investigated? How will the official determine what the disease is and what actions need to be taken because of it? Will a business be closed until verification of the disease is determined? Will the business be compensated for its lost revenue if the closure was deemed unnecessary? For the next few months, seasonal allergies, which is not a communicable disease is going to affect a large percentage of our population. The symptoms of seasonal allergies are very similar to many communicable diseases, sneezing, runny nose, coughing, and even low-grade fevers. In Section 5, authority is given to forbid public gatherings when deemed necessary to control outbreaks or epidemics. Does this not only apply to churches and businesses, but also protests that are currently taking place in many areas of the state. In section six, any business violating a public health order may be subject to administrative action, any licenses it possesses in the county. What exactly does this mean? Permanent or temporary suspension? What are the criteria for the suspension? How does it impact the community or city license renewal process? Does one supersede the other? How would the length of the temporary suspension be determined? How would the number of offenses entered, enter into the determination of suspension or its length? What happens to a citizen after their fourth infraction? Before I include, conclude my concerns, I want to make a personal statement to the board. A question we must all ask ourselves is, when do we give up personal freedom for the betterment of society as a whole? In some cases, the answer is simple and straightforward. In other cases, such as this, it is not. Religious freedom, moral beliefs, and personal freedom all come into play. The best example I have is the immunization laws of our state. All children are required to be immunized against childhood diseases, which are deadly to many of them. However, we allow parents to opt out of their child receiving them for religious or moral reasons. When the vaccines against COVID-19 become available, will we require all the people to receive it or can we opt out? It seems as if fear is driving our decisions. We do not seem to be taking our time and making sound decisions. The quick fix seems to be the answer without thinking them through or the consequences of their actions. Our great president, Franklin Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This ordinance is being driven by the media and political mania. I applaud you for thinking of ways to protect the great citizens and tourists in Sheboygan County. Please take time to consider your actions and their consequences. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next is Christy Wright. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Dr. Christy Reitz. I live at 228 2nd Street in Sheboygan Falls. I also own Sunshine Yoga Sheboygan at 1517 South 12th Street. Thank you for allowing me to come and speak tonight. In February of 2019, I started my own business, a yoga studio in Sheboygan. With Governor Evers' stay-at-home order, I was forced to temporarily close my business. On May 26, 2020, my bank account for my business was at $2.67. This was my balance without paying any rent for April and May, thanks to the graciousness of my landlord, who also did not collect rent for his other two fitness tenants. $2.67 was all that was keeping me from a zero balance. When I was able to, re, uh, able to operate again, after careful examination of the recommended guidelines, I went to work writing cleaning procedures and policies that would keep my clients and employees safe. Our current motto at the studio is practice safely, practice responsibly, and practice with physical distance. Words matter. We practice with physical distance. We have not and will not stop socializing. I have worked hard over the past year and a half to build relationships with my clients, between our teachers and among our community. I have built trust within my yoga studio. As a business owner, this is how we survive. If our clients, patrons, customers, patients, or employees don't trust us, our business will fail, period. Trust is built over a long period of time, but the destruction of trust takes seconds. The proposed Sheboygan County Ordinance Number 3 is government overreach. Many others have addressed opposition to this ordinance from a personal stance. I want to be made sure to bring up the business owner's perspective. Many of my yoga clients come to Sunshine Yoga to escape the harsh realities of their daily lives. Some suffer trauma, anxiety, PTSD, and other mental health impairments, all of which are reasonable exemptions, as identified in Governor Evers' Emergency Order Number 1. Until the proposed ordinance, number six, subsection B, states, any business in which an individual is violating a public health order shall ask the individual to leave the premises. Businesses and organizations may rely on an individual's statements if they claim to be exempt from the health order for the reasons permitted. Tasking Sunshine Yoga or any other business to betray that trust as a business that a business has built by asking if or why a client has an exception from the mass mandate would be an inappropriate and not conducive to maintaining trust. Have you considered what this will look like for implementation? What are you asking? What you're asking would require me, the business owner, to literally spend every hour of every day that my business is open at the front door. We, the business owner, can't possibly expect to place this type of responsibility with our licenses at stake in an employee's hands because as a business owner, we could lose everything. Have you considered what this will do to the small business community? You are also asking business owners to determine exemption without defining what is, quote, reason permitted, unquote. This is a lawsuit waiting to happen. The Americans with Disabilities Act and other civil rights protect people from needing to explain their exemption. I'll give you an example. I'm now standing at the door waiting for yoga clients to arrive instead of upstairs spending time communicating and building community with my clients. A woman walks in without a mask. A woman whom I've known and become friends with. A woman who supports my business. I now need to ask her why she's not wearing a mask. She's a survivor of domestic abuse. Her ex-husband used to hold his hand to her mouth to dominate over her. Is this really the type of disclosure that's necessary? You have one minute. Is this really what you want me to ask patrons? Then, if I ask my patron and they tell me something and I deem it appropriate, what happens if you don't? Then I lose my right to run a business. Can't I operate within the current guidelines of Governor Evers' emergency order? where I'm to assume that if someone is not wearing a mask that they have a reasonable exemption. You might say that that's an extreme example, and you're right, it is extreme, but in the world we live in, and my small community of clients, I can't afford to lose one. To craft, such an, to craft and initially approve such a controversial and critical ordinance to be introduced to the full county board, I would assume a lot of time was needed. An ordinance of this magnitude surely would have necessitated deep reflection, critical thinking, and discussion. Yet, in less than 36 minutes, this ordinance was approved by the HHS committee last Friday. The meeting was called to order at 8.03 and adjourned at 8.39. 36 minutes. It took me a lot longer than 36 minutes to write what I'm reading for you tonight. 
To close, I'd like to ask each one of you to dig deeply and to ask questions and to seek advice and consider what you're asking business owners to do. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Jones. Dan Jones, W7748, County Highway W, Cascade. I tried to stay out of politics for a while and concentrate on my family, spend time raising my children, loving my wife, instead of battling hopeless partisan political fights, but here I am. Facts first, on Thursday, August 13, the county administrator, according to the minutes, um, called for a special meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee on Friday. On Friday, the administrator, who is unelected, proposed an ordinance written by the Wisconsin Counties Association to the committee, and it was unanimously passed. So our county government is pushing an ordinance that is written by an unelected member an uh, unelected person that is not a member of the board, and it is written by someone who's not even in our county. I know government has strayed far from what it is supposed to do, but maybe if we want unelected people pushing legislation that is not written in our county, we should disband our county government and hire some Madison public relations company to run our county. The older members will remember when supervisors did a little more work and they didn't rely on an administrator to herd them in the wrong direction. Facts. The administrator has been saying this ordinance just sum, sums up, streamlines, and softens the state ordinance 252 and other. If that were true, they would word it so people could understand it and draw that conclusion for themselves. They would also say, they also say that it is not about forced vaccinations or radical things like that. Like forced vaccinations is some laughable conspiracy theory. Let, rem let me remind you, last Christmas when you were celebrating, a mask mandate was a laughable conspiracy theory. Facts, state statute 252 says that during a state of emergency, a public health authority can order any individual to receive a vaccination unless that vaccination is likely to lead to serious harm or unless the individual for reasons of religion or conscience refuses to obtain the vaccination. The public health authority can isolate or quarantine any individual who is unable or unwilling to receive a vaccination. The department shall promulgate rules that specify circumstances, if any, under which the vaccination may not be performed on an individual. So the statute says an individual can deny a vaccination based on religion or conscience, but then it says that the department has the ability to determine if, the, if your conscience or your religion is a valid reason. They've been saying that this is an old statute meant for polio and things like that, and it will never be implemented. What is also a fact is that no matter what side of the political aisle you are on, you see government agencies and courts misinterpreting or injecting new meaning into old laws and regulations all the time. So what will happen in the future? They say the welfare of humanity is always the alibi of tyrants. Of course, COVID and communicable diseases are real and precautions need to be taken. But do you know what else is real? Governments and politicians that take advantage of situations for their own personal gain. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you are on again, Republicans look and see that there's welfare fraud, unaccountable budgets throughout agencies, unions that control governments, Democrats say that there's fraud protectionism in police departments, unaccountable military budgets and big businesses that control government. So how come now we turn a blind eye and follow the government's lead on COVID and what is ever, whatever else is next? Could big business be in on this as well? Ignorance is your only excuse for at least not thinking about this and ent entertaining the thought. Yes, COVID is real. People will die and people will get sick. You know what else is real? Medications that were tested and found to be safe now causing profound problems. Foods that were tested and deemed to be safe now causing diabetes and heart disease. Antiperspirants that cause cancer. FDA approved birth controls that cause side effects in women and birth defects in children. Toyota didn't mean to create a minivan with an airbag that starts on fire and kills people, but that was an unintended consequence. You have one minute. So what are the unintended consequences of wearing a mask and lowering our oxygen levels? For every action, there is an equal or greater reaction. I'm not worried about myself or adults, but have they ever took children and, and lowered their blood oxygen level? by 5 or 10 percent for seven hours a day. 
to see if there are adverse effects of their growing brain. I would bet if this was done, it would be considered child abuse. And who will be responsible 10 years from now if there are adverse effects that are realized? I will not risk this on my first grader. Yes, COVID is real, but do you know what else is real? The fact that viruses live longer on surfaces than they do in the air. So sit in a parking lot or in this room and observe people's mask wearing skills. See how many times they touch it and adjust it before going into the store. Try to guess if that person has ever washed that cloth that is filled with spit bacteria and potentially COVID. And then think of all the things in the store that they're touching. Think of your waiter in the nice restaurant that goes into the bathroom. How does he touch that mask? What might he get on, transmitted to the mask and then back to his hands and to your plate? Do you know, you know what, you know you don't treat your, no, think of your own practices. Don't put yourself on a high horse. Do you wash your mask? Don't, do you treat your mask with much respect? Do you touch your face because it's getting uncomfortable? And then transfer whatever is on your face to your hands? and then to everything you touch during your everyday life spreading germs. It's easy to go along with something that's popular opinion, especially when the media is squashing any counter science. A man who does not think for himself does not think at all. All right, thank you, Dan. Dr. Toby Watson. I'll give you one minute left. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Toby Watson. I live at 403 Lakewood Court in Kohler, Wisconsin. Uh, I was born and raised here. My wife and I have 31 years. I have a vested interest in obviously keeping all of you safe as well as my own family. And I had a wonderful prepared five-page thing to talk about, but after listening to the other speakers, I've decided to abandon it because I think I covered a lot of the same information that they're telling you. So maybe I can tell you something that they don't talk about. Uh, we talk about assimilation and accommodation. All of you, for the most part, have made up your minds which way you're probably going to go with this already. We do that as human beings. I'm a psychologist. I can tell you that humans tend to do that pretty quickly. Unless something radically changes your mind to sway you to a different your political ideology, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, it's going to be about the same. This has become very politicized. We've recognized that this virus has become politicized between the two different parties. If you tend to be more Republican, eh, you tend to support the idea of having more freedoms, maybe not wearing a mask for that reason alone. For if you're a Democrat, no, we say that they're bad, that they're not wearing it. You don't care about people, maybe. I care greatly about people. I donate most of my time seeing patients. I've done that for over 15 years. What I've recognized is that our history has been plagued throughout time for thousands of years. Power will corrupt. There's no question about it. Politicians come into office and they mean well and they do well, except for the fact that then they start to sell their soul. Power will corrupt. No matter who you are, it's biblical. In my field, for you that don't know, Nazi Germany came about. People say, oh, God, not another Nazi story. But do you know where that actually started? It was psychiatrists, actually, that came up with it. American psychiatrists, actually. We used to determine, based on people's ideology, who would be maybe feeble-minded or mentally ill and not. And it was political. If you had a certain political party that you didn't like, I could diagnose you, institutionalize you. No, no due process. This happened in Russia as well, communist Russia. What we don't realize is that when we give power to somebody, and this latitude of power, where they can say to you, I think that you need to take a vaccine, because I believe that as the doctor. And if I'm the health officer, I can create that under this ordinance and mandate it and force you to do it. But yet, if I'm a doctor and I don't agree with that, where's my freedom? Where's my choice? Americans fought for that freedom. They died for it. My father was a Marine, is a Marine. We fought for that freedom so that we could choose for ourselves. And I get the idea of saying that, hey, well, what if me not knowing could infect somebody else? I understand that idea. We still have that freedom. If I am concerned and worried, then I need to take precautions for myself and maybe quarantine or sci-fi isolate or maybe get a real mask that actually filters. It's interesting, as some of the other people talked about their masks, if you look at the box of all the masks that you're wearing, they say right on it, it doesn't stop coronaviruses. It doesn't. It's like trying to stop a fart smell through your jeans 
and that is actually a true statement. COVID-19 is extremely small, and it passes through those masks that you're wearing. That, what you're wearing, stops large spittle. People that have large spittle. But we're not worried about the large spittle. That's why the CDC, Dr. Fauci, the World Health Organization, the WHO, all said, don't, wear, don't bother wearing masks. And then all of a sudden, something changed, where they said, no, you have to do it now. Well, what changed? There was a new research. I've done it. There's no research out there that says that it's stopping it. It was a political change that they wanted to have people start wearing masks. And maybe there's some you know, precaution from it. The large spittle doesn't end up on vapors and things like that, if you're actively symptomatic. You have one minute. But that's not what we're trying. That's not what they're asking for. We're looking for obedience, that you follow and that you listen. And now this is a way for them to create a law or an ordinance that mandates it. I've never taken a flu shot. I never will. Again, under this uh, ordinance proposed, it would say that, hey, Toby, that's not okay. We're going to force you to do this now. And we're going to have a serious problem. We're going to have a revolution within our own country of people who value that freedom and have fought for it, and the people who say, no, you have to do what we want. And heaven forbid if that health official becomes a little more corrupt, a little more politicized, a little bit power hungry, because you will all be vulnerable. It doesn't matter what side of the uh, political spectrum you're on. It depends on who's in power at that time. I really, really pray that you all do not allow this to continue or even put it to committee. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Justin Webb. Hi, I'm Justin Webb. Uh, I live at 5216 Grody Road. Uh, I'm the owner of Sun Graphics Media, Franz and Graphics, Game On, Bev Carts, and Semicolon Properties in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I employ 50 people plus, um, and that may not seem like a lot of people, but those people are my family. Uh, I care about them deeply, and I am responsible for taking care of them in many, many ways. Today, I'm going to share with you a story. Uh, it's a story of a child whose earliest childhood memory is that of his father beating his mother unconscious while she laid on the living room floor. It's a story of a child who was so poor in rural Arkansas that he and his brother were forced to burn their toys in their living room while their drug-induced father laid there, passed out. I made a promise to myself that day. I made a promise that I would never make my family live like that. That boy, that mother eventually left. That boy was adopted by a great father. Um, he met a wonderful woman, raised a great family, and moved to the community that he loves deeply. Um, that boy took a tremendous risk. He started businesses. He put everything on the line so that other people can enjoy their jobs. He took a risk knowing that if his business fails, that boy will be just as poor as he was when he was a child. He will have failed his family, he would have failed himself, and he would have failed his employees. That boy was me. But my story, while it may be unique, is not different from any other business owner that is sitting out there protesting, that is calling you and emailing you. They have put it all on the line. We don't get the freedoms of saying, oh, we'll just get a paycheck. If we have customers that leave, if we are forced to ask them to wear their mask, we might lose customers. We've lost so much already. We're already at limited capacity. Some of us have paychecks that are $2.07. I'm negative on one of my businesses. I employ 50 people. When I have a customer that leaves, you are taking food off my employee's table. I know it doesn't feel that way, but that is exactly what happens with business owners in Sheboygan County. This ordinance will affect those very entrepreneurs that drive the economy of Sheboygan County. Our very own Sheboygan County Economic Development Council released a report that says we have the lowest income disparity in the nation. 
That is driven by the entrepreneurs who are fighting this ordinance. I implore you to consider what you are doing. The great Adam Payne, who does great stuff for us, truthfully. The great Adam Payne wrote a letter to WHBL about this article and stated that it was out of context. It was not their intent. With all due respect, the road to hell is paved with great intentions. I, I, when Barack Obama signed the executive order for the DACA kids, he did so with great intentions. He did so with the trust that the system would not fail him. But he didn't realize was that his, the next president would be able to use a Supreme Court order and would have unlimited powers. I bet Barack Obama didn't understand those intentions. And I bet there's a lot of people in this room today that don't like that the current president has that executive power. You do not know who will sit in your seat or your seat or your seat in 10 years. The rules and the ordinances that you pass today will have tremendous impact on my children, your grandchildren, your children, their children. This is not something that is easily unwound, and I wonder if it is actually even necessary. You have one minute. Thank you. I have it from our very own attorney that this is actually an addition to the penalties. And I quote from the email that I received today. The ordinance provides several penalties to Chapter 252 violations as an alternative to criminal penalties provided under Wisconsin Statute 252.25. The county can not prevent the state from taking enforcement. Why are we looking at this? Why are we adding additional penalties to businesses that have lost so much? I respect the fact that the intention is good. All of the people in this room are honorable. All of your intentions are good. You serve. But what we are doing is wrong. And to my colleagues that are outside right now protesting, not allowed to be in here, for far too long we've been asleep at the wheel. We've been silent. We've assumed good intentions. We've been too busy to care. We've been apathetic. We've trusted our elected officials. And we've been divided. And we've allowed issues like this to pass unobstructed. It should be a wake-up call that we must never be apathetic. We must never be too busy. We must never be too trusting ever again. We must be vigilant. We must participate. We must never be the silent majority, and we must be united. Thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. Is Ruth Valerio here? State your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Ruth Villarreal. I reside at 1406 Pennsylvania Avenue here in Sheboygan. I'm a former licensed practical nurse of eight plus years at Rocky Knoll Healthcare Center, our county run facility. I say former because effective June 22nd of this year, I was terminated from my employment for declining COVID-19 testing, which goes against my faith and sincerely held beliefs. The county saw fit to make a new policy only four days prior to mandatory testing. Under this new policy, it stated I could request accommodation based on the Fair Employment Act sections 111.31 through 111.397 of the Wisconsin statutes. I bring this before the board and speak freely before many residents who are here and also outside of the facility. But I direct my concerns to Adam Payne, who is our county administrator. You were quoted in an email sent to all board members last Thursday and published on WHBL's website as follows. Quote, the purpose of this ordinance is to be prepared if the situation gets more dire and if greater county-wide action needs to be taken and it includes your legislative oversight. The ordinance also includes an enforcement component that is easier to administer and less punitive, again, if needed. You were also quoted to say the proposed ordinance was drafted by our Corporation Council with the input of public health professionals, Chairman Cope and others. 
We were further quoted in a clarification piece to WHBL Monday morning. Quote, the ordinance being brought before the board for review essentially softens the state statutes in place for communicable disease, end quote. I could be misinformed, but but to my knowledge, no one on this board has a medical degree. Furthermore, it is my experience, having lost my job, that this board has not upheld Wisconsin state laws. We are bombarded with wordplay, and the people are given if to soften the blow, when in reality it is or. Take a COVID-19 test, or you will be terminated. Put a mask on, or you'll be fine. In less than an hour, I was denied my civil rights. And I stand before you unemployed after eight years of community service to my county and over 13 years as a licensed practical nurse. I have no reason to believe that this board has our best interest in mind. You want these proposals to pass, but you don't think that Wisconsin laws apply to you. I was told by corporation that corporation counsel would get back to me about being denied my civil rights. I never got a response. Perhaps the council would like to address the taxpayers of the county as to a reason why nurse of over eight years in good standing with no complaints on file from residents or family members would be denied employment for upholding precautionary measures no different than the ones utilized by by the board today. Whether or not the county chooses to acknowledge it, I am a phenomenal nurse and I take much pride in having served the public and the capacity for not not only as a nurse, but as one of two minority nurses that I know of employed at Rocky Knoll for the past eight years. Not only do I oppose this proposal, this ordinance three, I request that the board uphold state laws that are current in place, currently in place, because all men and women are created equal in the eyes of God and the laws of the United States. For one minute. Respectfully. A little background on myself. My family came here to Wisconsin in 1976. I am the youngest of seven children. My family of nine was on complete state assistance up until I graduated from nursing school in 2007. I thought that that was going to be the last time I would have to ask for any assistance. I'm on week nine. I've almost exhausted every penny that I've saved. But you want me to trust you. Are you putting food on my table? I asked nothing for 13 years. I'm asking for you to take that into consideration and remember my face. And remember how hard I worked for years, nonstop, through the summers, getting through school, to get my license so that I could be torn away because of my beliefs. You don't have that authority. You don't. With all due respect. And now we have Pat Schutt. My name is Pat Shutt. I live at 4624 Amanda Lane in Sheboygan. After the state Supreme Court overturned the Evers administration's stay-at-home order in mid-May, 
several counties attempted passing ordinances, ordinances to create new powers and expand the existing powers of their public health officers. Many of these efforts were thwarted by citizens who rightly saw their tyrannical nature. Most of these ordinances were based on Chapter 252 of the state statutes. Per several state senators, including Dewey Strobel, these statutes are antiquated and poorly written and need to be corrected by the le legislature. There were rumors that Governor Evers' Department of Health Services was behind this county level initiative and rumors that the Wisconsin Counties Association was also involved in this. Of course, the Wisconsin Counties Association claimed they were in no way involved. <coughs> Excuse me. I find it very disturbing that a special meeting of the Sheboygan County Health and Human Services Committee was called one day prior to the WCA issuing its guidance and that more than several county board members were caught unaware and could not attend this special meeting. What was the urgency in the county administrators scheduling this meeting for late in the day on a Friday afternoon? I believe you can all draw your own conclusions. This guidance claims not to be a template or a model, yet that is exactly what it is, and the results are in your hands. It empowers unelected bureaucrats and administrators with even more power over the citizens in their county. I feel this is simply un-American and wrong. I refer to section 1009-3A, the Sheboygan County Health Officer upon the appearance of any communicable disease in Sheboygan County will immediately investigate all circumstances. Issue number one, is the Sheboygan County Health Officer an elected or an appointed position? Do we have yet another unelected bureaucrat unanswerable to those over whom they have been given broad powers in this ordinance, directing us with no ballot box remediation? Issue two, the words appearance of any. What does appearance mean? not actual diagnosis. Appearance is a very broad and nebulous term, giving wide attitude with interpretation. This is all in the ordinance proposal. Any communicable disease, COVID is obvious. Does this also include seasonal flu, SARS, MERS, STDs, the common cold, if STDs occur in children, what assurances of parental rights are there? As written, the ordinance requires parents to report to the county in the event their child gets an STD, in the event anyone gets STD. In my opinion, this is a gross violation of medical and personal privacy. Issue four, will immediately investigate. Will is a directive, there is no choice. The Sheboygan County Health Officer is going to be one very busy person. Of course, this will require the hiring of additional personnel to conduct investigations, issue tickets, close businesses, and generally stick their noses into citizens' personal lives and businesses. This government board will require additional funding that will be required to feed this over governmental overreach and bloat. Issue five, all circumstances. Does that include contact tracing? Probably. Now, easily done in stealth mode through your cell phone. This is a huge privacy violation, not limited to just COVID tracking. Is this ordinance poorly written or purposely written to be vague and open to interpretation? put into the hands of the wrong persons and they are here with us tonight. It can be a dangerous tool to persecute and prosecute citizens. Sheboygan County has had a low incidence of COVID. A minimum of four of the eight deaths were terminal patients. 
Our hospitals and clinics were not overrun, and they were not unable to cope. State and national numbers of deaths, cases, and testing results are at best inaccurate. This ordinance is unnecessary. It is purposely broadly and vaguely written. Why? It is on a, fi a fast track. Why? I suggest you ask yourself those questions. This ordinance is an unnecessary solution to a problem that does not warrant this drastic and overreaching policy that will violate privacy, the right to freely associate, and the right to earn a living. I stand before you on behalf of my beautiful family, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. There is no reason to propose and accept this ordinance. I ask all of you to please vote no. Okay. That's all we have for public addresses. Thank you. Next is letter communications and announcements. I have a resolution from the Bayfield County Board of Supervisors regarding nonpartisan procedure for redistricting. Okay, we've taken that numerous times, so we'll receive that for information. And finally, I have a resolution from Adams County Board of Supervisors requesting the State Senate reconvene to address 13 water bills passed by the Assembly. We've also received that, we'll receive that for information as we've had it before. That is all. Next is County Administrator's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. This is the first time we've been in the county board chambers with the new plexiglass and social distancing. Folks are probably sitting at different desks and perhaps in different chairs. I hope everyone's feeling reasonably comfortable. I want to thank Jim Tabeast and Chris Lewinsky in particular, who over the last couple of weeks worked with their teams to make this all possible, move, move mics, and, and again, give everybody a sense of safety and, and uh, appropriate social distancing. So thank you to them. Um, a couple of things I want to touch on before I touch on the proposed ordinance, but it certainly is nice with all the uncertainty and angst and stress associated with COVID to see so many wonderful things going on in our community. It was just uh, two, three weeks ago that we had a groundbreaking, the Kohler Center for Marsh Education Facility at the Sheboygan Marsh. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been to the marsh before. It's one of the jewels of Sheboygan County. And I just can't tell you how nice it was to be surrounded by a lot of good people there who helped bring that to fruition. It's, it's all about collaboration between Sheboygan County and, and businesses and many others who generously donated time and money. But uh, already back in 2005, you might recall, we had an ad hoc committee that worked together to tap into the Sheboygan County marsh and make it even a a better place and ultimately built the tallest wooden observation tower in the state. A Lil Pipping continues to be a founding member and president of that group and our supervisor Keith Obler also was on that committee at that time. And fast forward to just a couple of weeks ago for the last few years they've continued to work, set their high, uh, sights even higher on building this new environmental center. This is going to help over a thousand kids a year with educational training opportunities at the marsh be a much nicer facility than that old Camp Wicota, um I don't know what you want to call it anyway, trailer that's looking pretty rough. And again, uh, just, a, just a wonderful amenity for our community. The, the overall cost of the facility is going to be a little over $2 million. The county's contributing $350,000, including the land and the site work. And it was the Kohler Company, the Bratz, Bratz Foundation, Sargento, the Steyer Foundation, and of course, many, many others that made that happen. And it's one of many examples of working collaboration to help make good things happen in our community. The other that's on your agenda tonight, I think we're going into our fourth year with the half percent sales tax. Uh, this was controversial four years ago, and it was the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation Board of Directors and our heads of local government and many in the community that pulled together and said it was the right thing to do. And they felt that way because our transportation system was really in rough shape. And thankfully, that since that's been enacted, we now have about 
nine to ten million dollars a year that go to direct transportation related work I believe we're still the only county in the state that shares 1.5 1.6 million of those sales tax dollars with our units of government for their transportation work and a portion of the money is used for direct property tax relief so every penny of it goes into either direct transportation property uh, projects or direct property tax relief so pleased to see that continue you have that for you this evening and also very pleased I don't know if any of you have driven out of town lately but uh, highway 23 they're they're laying down the concrete and it's looking good it's looking good and that has been a huge monumental effort of this county board and this community pulling together to improve that dangerous stretch of roadway and so good to see it finally happening so if you haven't been out that way of late they are literally pouring concrete and making good progress COVID, of course has been all consuming the last five six months I will readily admit in my 22 plus years this has been the least satisfying five or six months of my career here it's incredibly challenging none of us signed up for this I don't think any of us are enjoying this I think of the new chair taking over for chairman Tom Wagner and and all the calls and angst and stress and it's just a remarkable time listening to the speakers this evening hearing their pain their concern their questions you can't help but be empathetic and it's helpful to have that input it is a difficult time for all of us as you know I have two daughters that work in the front lines in health care I hear about it all the time I have a, a new uh, son-in-law who's working as a police officer in Wauwatosa and I watched some uh, video of him the other day standing all day long as protesters pushed him around and heckled him and he just stood there day after day and took it it's just a difficult time it's so important that we're working together and pulling together and communicating being open transparent so important that's how I've rolled for the last 20 years and that's how I'm going to continue to operate until I move on and, and you hire a new administrator that's how we roll in Sheboygan County we work in collaboration we problem-solve we prepare and we do the best we can to serve this community and of course that's why I'm so part to be a, so proud to be a part of this team the last few months the county board has taken action to support our public health staff and our and the collaboration that's been in place as well as deal with the costs associated with this and I just want to refresh your memory at the County Board Leadership Forum we talked a little bit about well what are the costs associated with COVID and you may recall we were looking at about a 5.1 million dollar hit to our approximately 150 million dollar budget 5.1 million dollar hit and unlike some areas I mean we're, we weren't just gonna sit there and do nothing we took action to start addressing those shortfalls we thought we might see a property tax levy reduction of about 1.3 million and a sales tax reduction of about 2.7 I'm pleased that we have updated revenue shortfall projections today obviously as the year goes on the information gets better and property taxes uh, to the credit of our community uh, we're seeing them paid timely and and we didn't see as many delays as we thought might occur because of people hurting so rather than about a 1.3 million dollar shortfall it might be closer to 200,000 and then sales tax revenue we had originally projected about a 2.7 million dollar reduction we think it'll be about a 1.1 million dollar reduction so this is good news and to the credit of Greg Schnell and our transportation committee they've already made adjustments with transportation projects how many miles of overlay or highway work will do and to our credit of our organization as a whole everyone is sought to be part of the solution we've already cut back on contingency structural travel training furniture things that we could and so we've already saved or captured about 1.7 million dollars in savings to help soften that blow so um, good news in that regard in March I think that was the first meeting we really started as a board talking about COVID and I shared that day that in Sheboygan County thankfully we only had four confirmed cases on March 17th and in the state it was about 896 
uh, in Wisconsin, we had 72, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong. On March 17th, we had four confirmed cases, and today we have 896. So that's how much we've seen in positive cases increase since March. Four in March 17th, 896 today. On March 17th, we had zero deaths. Uh, to date, we've had eight deaths. And fortunately, we've been able to keep that very limited, in part because of the exceptional work of our nursing homes across the, the county, particularly Rocky Knoll. It is so vitally important that we don't allow COVID to enter those facilities. And it's breaking all of our hearts that they're not seeing the visitors and they're all wearing PPE and it's a much more stressful environment. But fortunately, we've been able to keep COVID out of those facilities for the most part and limit deaths, unlike many other counties and parts of the country. We're proud of that. In Wisconsin on March 17th, there were 72 confirmed cases, zero deaths. Today, 66,000 confirmed cases, 1,052 deaths. And in the United States on March 17th, there were 7,000 confirmed cases, 100 deaths. Today, there are 5.4 million confirmed cases and 170,000 deaths. We continue to hear from some people, not many anymore, but some people that use words like hoax or this isn't real. And I find that remarkable. It's very real. And fortunately, as a county, we've been doing everything we can to protect our community and work in collaboration with, with individuals and the business community to try to keep it the heck out of here. Our goal is to defeat COVID. Every single one of us in this room should want to defeat COVID. That's our goal. That's how we keep people safe. That's how we keep our businesses open. That's how we keep our schools open. That's how we keep our hospitals for, from becoming overrun. That's our goal. Every single person in Sheboygan County should be saying, that's our goal. What can I do to help defeat COVID? So our county board has stepped up on two, three, four different occasions, passing resolutions and ordinances to assist with that response. In two instances, I think you had a county state of emergency, and that created some angst. But well, what does that all mean, and what does that all do? And we heard from some people, and the way state laws are written, as someone mentioned, some of them are kind of old, and it's old language, and it can be a little scary. But you know what? We've been into this six months now. We haven't had one countywide public health order. Not one. Everything has been working with best practices and guidance and in collaboration with our community. Not everybody is part of it, but that's the approach we take. And that is the approach we will continue to take. In May, the Sheboygan County Board passed resolution number one. And at that time, we extended the state of county emergency once again because we have a pandemic in play that authorized the county to continue to purchase additional personal protective equipment so our nurses and CNAs and emergency responders and others in the community have what they need to protect themselves and their families and provide the care that's so important. We've hired more contact tracers, more limited term employees that are helping with that as people get sick. And also at that time, the county board supported the county public health safe uh, uh, health safe restart recommendations and guidelines. We went on record supporting our public health officials because are they doing heavy lifting? Are they working hard? Star Grossman, Amanda, Elizabeth, Matt Stripmotter, that team, they're working really hard to help provide guidelines and best practices to keep the community safe. Also at that time, the county board went on record and took action in support of the issuance of orders from the local public health officer under Wisconsin Chapter 252, it's been mentioned a number of times this evening, in the event of a surge in case or other circumstances require the exercising of such chapter. That's the Wisconsin current law. That's in the books right now. That's what every public health officer relies upon. And as a county board, we already took action. 
we said on May 19th, if things get worse, I mean, if we see a significant surge, if our hospitals become overrun, we support our public health officer putting orders in place to slow the spread of this horrible virus and to protect our community and to keep businesses open and to keep schools open and to keep our economy going. We took that action already. That's what's currently in the law. And that's what some people I think aren't fully appreciating as they look at this new ordinance. Since then, have we put any orders in place? No. Since then, have we continued to make progress holding the line? Yes. I mean, we've seen it creep up. As you heard me say, the numbers have creeped up. But overall, we've done a pretty good job. And I say we have done a pretty good job. We have gotten a lot of positive feedback from people in the community saying, thank you for your collaborative approach. Thank you for the guidelines. Thank you for working us to help beat down this horrible virus. On July 21st, the most recent county board meeting where the county took action, you had one key um, resolution or ordinance that you approved that evening, and it was twofold. One, it was to allow for remote meetings, which we're doing to keep the board safe and the committee safe, right? But you also took authority, to, you also authorized and changed the approach to how these expenditures are made. Under the emergency orders, I could authorize our emergency management director, our public health officer and others to purchase this personal protection equipment as needed. And they were doing it. And we've spent about $125,000, $150,000 now on personal protective equipment for our staff, for our nursing homes, for others. On July 21st, the board tightened that. As you may recall, you said going forward, if it's outside of our budget parameters, we know you're going to need to continue to purchase personal protective equipment. We know there, there's going to be needs to reallocate resources. We have hired additional contact tracers, but we want it authorized by the county administrator and the executive committee. You added a layer of checks and balances. I think it may have been Supervisor Testrudi who suggested that at a former meeting. It was a good idea. I'm fine with that. Why? Because we work in collaboration and we share this information. The other good thing about all these COVID-related expenses, most of them are reimbursed by the state and federal government. Not all of them, but most of them. And I can tell you, Wendy and her team are working hard to make sure we tap into those resources so we get those dollars rather than it falling on our Sheboygan County taxpayer shoulders. So that brings us to today, to the last few days. The five, six months that we've been working on COVID, all of us having such a good time with it. Of course I mean that sarcastically. It hasn't been any fun at all. It's incredibly grueling and difficult. There's no playbook. Nobody knows what tomorrow's going to bring. Everybody's doing the best that they can. That's all we can ask of one another. We have been having discussions with our hospital administrators. And we asked them, if, if the hospitals become overrun, when would that trigger take place? What does that look like? Because for those of us who are paying attention to what's happening in other parts of the country and the world, we've seen hospitals overrun. I sure hope we don't see it here. I don't think we're going to see it here, but it's possible. And that's what emergency planning, as we all know, is all about. So we asked the hospital presidents, we said, what's that trigger point? And they told us, we didn't know, they said, you know, if 50% of our ICU beds and COVID surgical beds are filled, 50% with COVID patients, not the other patients, there's still needs in the community where people get hurt and need, need space in the hospitals. But if 50% are filled with COVID patients, they said that would put them on the brink of being overrun and very concerned with their ability to respond and care for patients. And they say the brink because if you're at 50%, well, that doesn't sound so bad, right? But as a community, if we don't work together and do something differently, how are we going to keep them from being overrun? You're just going to sit back and say, oh, they're at 50%. Boy, I hope they, hope they do all right. What if it's your parents that are in there? or your mom and dad, or your kids. You want to make sure the hospitals are able to care for our loved ones, and our family members, and our neighbors. 
So we went to the Health and Human Services Committee with a proposed ordinance. And it was held that Friday morning at 8 o'clock. And there was collaboration with our public health professionals. We did have the guidance of Wisconsin Counties Association, uh, a work group that was working on this, because all 72 counties are looking at what can they do if things get worse. What does that look like? Some counties already have ordinances like this in place. Others don't. No, we're all a little different. Since the state has kicked this down to counties, we have hundreds of local units of governments and school districts wrangling their hands together, wondering how are we going to best serve our community and do this the best we can. It's difficult. So we came in with a proposed ordinance that was developed in collaboration with our public health professionals, the input of our hospital presidents, the input of the Wisconsin Counties Association, and others. And it's a, it's a proposal. And we went before them, we said, we certainly are going to continue the status quo. We're not looking to put in a new, there, is, there are no, I said it earlier, there are no countywide public health orders. We're not looking to do that. I want to make that so clear for people who are sensitive about, oh, this new ordinance and something's going to change. We're not looking to change anything. We're hoping that if people wear masks and social distance and take some personal responsibility, we're going to continue to beat this and someday get past this. But if needed, if our hospitals become overrun, what are we going to do? Are we going to do something? I think we should. And the Health and Human Services Committee agreed unanimously, yes, I think we should too. I think we should take more action. What does that action look like? Let's look at the rest of the ordinance. Right now, the first areas of the ordinance reference state law. So that's already there, right? They already, public health officers already have this authority. They can put an order in now if they want. But we all know how important it is to work in collaboration, and we all know how important it is to work together and be transparent and communicate. And so what we proposed was working in collaboration with our county board. We built in a checks and balance. Under current law, under the current statutes, a public health officer next week could put a countywide order in uh, requiring more social distancing in all bars and restaurants. Every table's got to be six feet apart. Our public health officer could do that under current law. They have the authority right now. But if that's not done in collaboration with the community, if that's not done in collaboration with the county board, if we're all not on the same page, just how effective do we think that'll be? So we built into this proposed ordinance checks and balances, legislative oversight that the Executive Committee and Health and Human Services Committee would need to review that public order and either agree with it or tell them, no, can do. So actually this ordinance doesn't empower our public health officer. Some of the calls we've gotten, oh, we're putting all this power in the hands of one unelected bureaucrat. It actually takes power away from the public health officer and distributes it and shares it with the county board. So we're preparing ourselves, if needed, for a significant surge or hospital becoming on the brink of being overrun. We're striving to work in collaboration with the county board and have now added a checks and balance where the Executive Committee and Health and Human Services Committee would need to approve that. As you all know, the county board trumps those committees. Let's say Executive and Health and Human Services say, yes, we support the public health order. We think there should be more social distancing in bars and restaurants, and all tables should be six feet apart. The county board can say, no, we don't support that. They can trump that. So we've added that in. If we don't pass this ordinance, and that's your prerogative, but if you don't pass this ordinance, then we go back to existing current state law that doesn't have that pr provision in it, that doesn't provide that legislative review, that doesn't have that checks and balances in place. And then finally, enforcement. <laughs> Who amongst us wants to have our police officers and deputies spending time going up to people that aren't wearing masks and asking them to do so, or going into businesses and spending their 
scarce and valuable resources and all the demands that they have on their plate. Who wants to ask them to do that? They don't want to do it. I've talked to the chief of police from the city of Sheboygan. I've talked to our sheriff. They are so stretched thin now and have so many other things to deal with. They recognize this is really important. They care. They want to see COVID defeated just like all of us. But they really don't want to have to get involved in enforcement if they don't have to. And under current state law, our district attorney, our public health officer, our deputies, our sheriff, they could all be involved with that. And the fines that are in current state law go up to, I think, 500 bucks or more and in jail. Well, that makes a lot of sense. We're going we're gonna to put people in jail because they're not wearing a mask. Or they're not social distancing. Really? Jails across the country have been letting people out so they don't get infected there and see a high death rate or, or people getting sick, which is very costly. We added some enforcement provisions, added, that are gentler. There's a 25 and a 50 and a $100 fine. And depending on our collaboration with the judges, that could change a little bit. We still need to talk to the judges about how that would work. Again, this is proposed. But it's far less punitive and dire than jail. And with the businesses that are referred to, I'm not worried about our businesses in Sheboygan County. We have a Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation made up of 40 of some of the pillars in our, in our county. Kohler Company, Sargento, Master Gallery, Johnsonville, list goes on and on. They're implementing masking in their organizations. It's done already. It was done before the governor's order to wear masks. Why? Because they want to protect their staff. They want to keep their businesses going. They want to make sure that families are protected when their employees go home. And they run lines. They run cheese lines and all sorts, all sorts of other lines. And if they get hit with COVID, it can significantly impact their operation. Many, if not most of our businesses, particularly ones I just mentioned, they've already stepped up to be part of the solution and are taking steps to protect. So we included this in here because if an order in the future had to be made because our hospitals were overrun and we had to take action in our community to slow the spread of the virus and allow our hospitals to be able to handle the number of patients that they're seeing. That if we did have a business out there who thought, heck with it, we don't need to be part of the solution, this would allow public health and their staff to follow up with that business and do something about it. So in summary, this was proposed because we want to be prepared. We want to work in collaboration. We want checks and balances with the county board. And we want to have the tools available to us to enforce if needed. This will go through the normal two-month process. This isn't being done quickly. The Health and Human Services Committee reviewed it. They've now referred it to the county board. Today, I anticipate Chairman Koch is going to refer this to the executive committee. It'll be vetted, discussed there. Maybe some changes will be made. I don't know. And then it'll come back to the county board next month. That's not what you read on the WHBL online article early Monday morning. I think my friend John DeMaster put that out at 4.50. I think he did it quickly. I consider him a good person, a friend, and WHBL does good work. But if you look at what they wrote, they said the vote was being taken tonight. It's not be. They said that it, the ordinance could require vaccinations, including for colds. We never had any discussion of vaccinations. None during this development of this ordinance. None. There's nothing in the ordinance that talks about vaccinations. And furthermore, and I confirmed this with our corporation council today because I wasn't 100% sure, local public health officers don't have the authority to require vaccinations through a public health order. That would have to be directed by the state. They don't have the authority, but I can tell you with 100% sincerity, we'd had no discussion of requiring vaccinations 
upon people and going down that road. Totally untrue. Yet the article you read referenced that as a strong possibility. It also mentioned, oh, we're undermining or usur usurping the police and deputies' ability to enforce this. Really? Ask the deputies and police if they want to enforce this. They'd rather have our public health officers do so and do so in a more measured and thoughtful manner. So it'll go through a two-month review process like any other ordinance and resolution. So I, I want to say I'm sincerely sorry for the confusion that has happened over the last 24, 48 hours. I've never in my career seen this response so quickly to misinformation, but it was misinformation. I, I know Facebook is a powerful tool, and it certainly worked to get people excited and feeling stress and angst, and that breaks my heart. We should be working together to lower the stress levels. This is a terrific community. We have a wonderful track record. There's so much going for us in Sheboygan County. People here have good intentions. People here are just good people. And our track record is working together to collaborate and problem solve. That's what we do. We all need to take a deep breath and pull together to defeat COVID. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, next, next item of business is consideration of committee reports. Resolution number eight, regarding approving standard intergovernmental agreement for 2021 county sales tax revenue sharing recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for approval of resolution number eight. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Under discussion? Seeing no lights, if you please vote. Supervisor Veldman, can you try it again? <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> that motion is approved unanimously. Third time seems to be the charm with the pressing of the I button. Resolution number nine. Regarding authorizing sale of sliver of county property at County Road EE and South 12th Street, recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Testrodi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to adopt. Thank you, Supervisor Testrodi. Supervisor Abler. I support that. Thank you, Supervisor Abler. Under discussion? Okay, seeing no lights, please vote. Supervisor Bosman and Nenig, can you try your button again? Try it one more time. All right, Supervisor Bosman works. Supervisor Nenig, keep trying, please. All right, that works. That motion is approved unanimously. All right, and I will pass the gobble, gobble to the vice chair. Good evening to you all. Resolutions introduced. Resolution number 10 from the Law Committee authorizing application for fiscal year 2020 Justice Assistance Grant Award and entering into a memorandum of understanding with the City of Sheboygan. Pursuant to rule number 13, it is anticipated that a motion to withdraw this proposed resolution will be made. If by a majority vote, the board votes to pull the resolution, it will be subject to immediate action. Okay. 
Supervisor Wagner? Wagner? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> How quickly they forget. Anyways, uh, I move that we pull resolution number 10, please. Thank you, Supervisor. Is there a second? Supervisor Hoffman? Thank you, Supervisor Hoffman. We'll vote on that. Yeah. Supervisors Nelson and Hoffman, please try your button again. Supervisor Hoffman. Yeah. All right, that's good. Motion to pull is approved unanimously. I would need a motion to uh, to consider uh, resolution number ten. Supervisor Gehring. Vice Chairman, I move for adoption. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I move, um, I second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Under discussion? Hearing none, all vote, please. Supervisor Damp, can you try your button, please? A third time, please. There you go. Thank you. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Uh, resolution number 11. From the Finance Committee regarding 2021 five-year capital plan. Resolution number 11 will be referred to executive committee. Resolution number 12. From Planning Resources, Agriculture and Extension Committee, approving permanent easement for village of Kohler sewage interceptor at Erie Avenue, Old Plank Road Trailhead. Resolution number 12 will be referred to executive committee. Resolution number 13. From Transportation Committee regarding authorizing county aid for culvert construction in the towns of Holland, Lima, and Sheboygan. Resolution number 13 will be referred to Finance Committee. Ordinance is introduced. Ordinance number three. From Health and Human Services Committee regarding creating section 10.09 disease control, providing for enforcement of public health orders and legislative oversight. Ordinance number three will be referred to Executive Committee. Mr. Testrudi, Supervisor Testrudi, would you help me with the next order of business? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll move to adjourn. Ms. Supervisor Huffman? Thank you, Supervisor Huffman. All please vote. So, Supervisors Nenig, Obler, Kulo, Damp, Wegner, O.J., Hoffman, Gehring, and Testrudi. Keep trying your button, please. <laughs> A third time, Ms. Uh, Fran, please. Yeah. There you go. It must be the plexiglass. Let's go with that. We are adjourned.